Hello, welcome back to the Eclipse Interesse in Yerson. It is my pleasure to see you all again for the second episode of my little exploration of the Goldberg variations. To be precise, it's not just exploring the Goldberg variations. Actually, it's seeing the Goldberg variations as a gateway to another world which, which, with which we are perhaps a little less familiar the world of the English virginalists and their further transmission through the composers who fled England due to religious persecution uh, for the continent and who brought the fruits of this wonderful music tradition to a place where it would develop into the environment that formed Johann Sebastian Bach. This time I take a piece by William Byrd, whom one could consider the foremost or perhaps the central figure of this English virginalist school and notice some striking similarities in details between it and the Goldberg variations. This is not to show that the Goldberg variations are some kind of copy. It is not to show that uh, it is any way less original. Indeed, it is not even to show that um, they belong to the same tradition because at the end of the day, they do not. Rather, it is to show that in order to understand a work from a, let's say, archeological perspective, it is very useful to compare it to similar works in a context which we are trying to relate to the work in question. And as a classical musician, that is indeed what I very much see myself as attempting to do a kind of archaeological pursuit that is, of course, contained in the word classical. So I would like to show you now this video that I just recorded. And um, I'll see you again live right after it. Today we continue our exploration of a world before the Goldberg Variations, which flourished in the second half of the 16th century. I will take this piece, Hugh Ashton's Ground by William Byrd, and show you some unexpected similarities between it and the Goldberg Variations by Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, it is not my intention at all to try to paint the Goldberg variations as derivative. Rather, it is to take this opportunity to tell you a bit about this musical environment, this musical tradition, far before any of the music we commonly hear nowadays, to the memory of which the Goldberg variations pay homage. Let me nevertheless as a starting point, simply list out prosaically these similarities. We have a theme which is in triple time and is a kind of stately dance. One could say that Hugh Ashton's ground is a kind of galliard uh, rhythm, just as the Goldberg Variations starts with an aria in the Sarabat rhythm. The next thing which is, of course, fundamental to both pieces is the fact that these are variations over a bass line. Last time we saw how these forms of pasacalia, of 
variation and a brand of really different formulations of the same idea. In Hugh Ashton's ground, what we have is a series of eight notes in the Goldberg range. It's, uh, it's 32. These are always present in the lowest voice and are, so to say, the ground upon which um, these variations are built. Now, how are the variations then built? Here we come to another similarity, that there are different kinds of variation. In the Goldberg variations, we have a very Cartesian structure where every third variation belongs to a certain type. We have the type that is motivated by figurative writing, by what you could call um, keyboard figuration or keyboard virtuosity. We have the type which is a kind of contrapuntal fantasy. And we have the third type which is the two voice canon. Now, in Hugh Ashton's ground by Bird, we also encounter various types of variation. And they are in some kind of alternation, not quite as strictly Cartesian, but we see, we see hints of it. We see that this kind of idea was part of the musical uh, build-up, of, of the musical um, elements that were coursing around the veins of uh, the musical environment. So the most obvious thing, since it's possibly the most typical of Bird, is what I call the contrapuntal fantasy. The way this is built is you take the bass line at the bottom. This is the series of eight notes repeated in whatever rhythm B. And you choose a theme, which has nothing to do with this grand you choose some kind of motive, and then you paste this motive on top of, or in, in the space above the ground, in any, any one of the various ways. What is interesting is, of course, to paste them in such a way that you get voices which make the impression of talking to each other. Now, in the Goldberg variations, uh, here is an example of that. Of course, uh, once again, a little bit exaggerated, but you see what I mean. This motive of the three notes, um, with its inversion, it appears in various places, in at, at various heights, meaning uh, sometimes here, sometimes there, and this creates a piece of music based on this motive, but which shares this ground bass line. Now here's an example from the bird. So here you hear how a similar kind of uh, construction is in evidence. Now let's go to another kind of variation, which by its obvious construction is also quite easy to understand. That's the canon. A canon is, as I'm sure many of you well know, the kind of music where 
two or more voices play exactly the same thing at different times. So you get uh, a, a line, and the same line repeated sometime later, which uh, is played at the same time as the next bit of the first voice. Now, the Goldberg variations uh, have, as every third variation, a two-voice canon at, uh, at a series of intervals that follows a, an obvious pattern. What we get in Hugh Ashton's ground is a series of canons, all at the octave, roughly every other variation. So the variation number seven starts like this. Then we get in variation nine. Between these two canons, we have a contrasting variation. It is a variation in the third style, in the arabesque style of what I called keyboard figuration. So you see that uh, we have this kind of structure of um, variation 6 and 8 are with these kinds of runs, and uh, variations 7 and 9 have this canonic uh, underpinning. So, this is in some way a kind of, uh, you could call it a similarity between the structures of these two works. Now, this is all rather technical. There's another point which probably makes an even bigger impression on the listener, and that is the overall structure of the work. You see, in classical and romantic variations, we often think of the ending of the set of variations as being a kind of culmination. Very often, the last variation is a little bit extended in order to increase the effect. In the Goldberg variations, we get a literal repeat of the theme. It is therefore a cyclical structure uh, which we are confronted with, where the end returns to the mood, to the music, and uh, one could also say to the spirit of the beginning. Is this unusual? Well, indeed, in the culture, in the musical culture of which I'm speaking, that is, uh, that of the English virginalists and later of the North German organ school, of course, uh, through Sveling, who was absolutely influenced by the English virginalists, we actually find this kind of approach quite often. In Hugh Ashton's ground, we get these um, very active variations, of which I've just played you a few. And at the end, I think uh, this must be number 12, the last one, we get something which returns to the mood and the rhythm, and indeed the um, sonority, in terms of register, of the beginning. Let me just play you the first few bars of the beginning.
let me just uh, note that this is an example of one of the most beautiful ideas or tricks that Bird came up with and which he often used at, the, um, at this moment in his variation sets, meaning at the beginning of the last variations, and that is to add an extra voice at the very top to become a kind of uh, ray of light or to be a little bit less poetic at this count. I have not treated the third type of variation very extensively. I mean the keyboard figuration type. That is because the master of that was not so much William Byrd, but rather John Bo, whom we will look at in more detail next time. Now, you may be asking also in terms of the second type, the canon type, whether uh, there is any precedent for this kind of organizing of canons in the Gopher variations. The point being that there should be in the set of uh, variations a series of strict canons at various intervals. Well, let me leave you with a piece by John Bull, some variations on a plane chart not on a ground base, but on a count of spheres. Right. I do apologize for the slightly worse audio quality of uh, this week's episode. It's because my microphone unfortunately ran out of battery, but I've now put new batteries into it. So this problem should be solved. Um, next week, I will be looking, as I said, at another composer of the English virginalists. 
perhaps the composer, which one could say, represents the other side of the whole movement and as William Byrd. William Byrd was perhaps the man of gravity and John Bull was the man who searched for sensation. We'll look at some of the wonderful inventions of John Bull about keyboard technique, about musical expression, and about how to create something that not only gives one food for thought, but viscerally moves a listener and a reader. See you next week.